So, um, you've done wonderful P4 labs, one, two, and three. You've uh, you started at the top. Um, you've gone a bit deeper, and then you've added some some C inside, and seen your wonderful packet scope. Um, well, we're now going to do um, a couple of labs, uh, which are just in C, and we will be using uh, the command line rather than using the SDK. So this is yep, using the Linux tools, using uh, editor of your choice, which I think we've chosen for you um, today, um, uh, which is Nano. I think uh, Emacs is not installed on everything. Um, and uh, we'll be using those tools on the actual servers that are next door, but using PuTTY on the machines that you've got in front of you. And um, the two labs that we'll be doing, um, this is lab four, there will be a lab five. Um, the first one is kind of a hello world. It's a um, beginning to understand uh, that actually it's just C. Um, and there are some tweaks that you can do, or twerks, tweaks, whatever they are, um, that are related to memory placement, placing structures in the memories. Because if you remember where I was at the beginning, um, there are a lot of memories, so these transactional memories, you've got to placing things in the right place. So really, the hello world in micro C is about compiling some C, seeing that it's normal, and seeing what happens when you place things in different places, and how we share. There are probably three handouts that you've been given so far, because we haven't handed out lab five, we handed out lab three. There are two nice colorful handouts that you don't need to play with. Um, the first, the thick one, is called The Joy of Micro C. This is a document that explains um, a lot of the concepts behind you know, the extra bits to do with programming on the NFP. Uh, and it works with the SDK. It's got examples that work with the SDK, but it's a, a big, thick-ish sort of thing. The second one is lab Hello World in Microsoft, which is the thin, colorful one, which, again, you're not going to need to use, but you can play with it um, if you're idling away um, or take it away with you. It'll be taken away. Um, and effectively, the lab Hello World in Microsoft is kind of the, the equivalent to the lab you will be doing in the CLI, uh, but in the SDK, which you've been using so far. So for those people who really love GUIs, you can do all the C stuff in the GUI. And the lab, there is a lab for you to do that. But we're not going to do that right now. We're going to be doing the CLI version. Now, um, I have been talking far too much over the past few days, and my voice is starting to go. So um, Chris will actually be going through the whole lab um, and um, from up here. But um, I'm going to talk you through a little bit of background first. Then you'll be doing the lab, and then I'll put us back together to go through a bit of what we've done and some of the extra issues or you know features that have, that have happened. Uh, just to recap what, we, what I talked about this morning is obviously we've got our C of workers, and we've got the transactional memories. And programming in C is about programming a C program for a worker um, and interacting with those memories. Uh, the micro C hello world is basically going to run, it's a simple program, it's going to run on a processor. Well, it's going to run on one of our micro-engines um, inside an island. So remember that the, you've, you've, you've seen, as uh, in the earlier labs, you've seen ME, the different MEs that are running, and you put breakpoints on them. Well, um, we're going to be putting a program on one of the micro-engines, and it will be using data storage in its local cluster target memory. So this lab is really about just starting to get up, up and, and, uh, and running. There is an uh, interconnect that makes all this stuff go that's called the CPP bus system that is the interconnect between the processors and the memories. And it's not important when they're going to dig into that a little bit more in the next lab. Uh, but um, just so you know, that these things are connected over a hosted transaction bus and planting a seed. Each ME is indeed a separate processor. You've seen this earlier. They uh, all run in parallel. Um, they each have their own private code store, so we can put different programs into different micro-engines. We'll be using um, just one or two, I think, in lab four, uh, in this lab. Um, 
different uh, microengines. Each microengine has got eight threads, and we'll be running all eight, although only one of them will be doing anything useful, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, but every thread on that microengine does run the same program. So if you want to run different branches with different threads, you have to do a conditional branch, an if statement. So you'll see a bit of that. This is our Hello World program. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, and you'll be typing this in, or at least you'll be cutting and pasting it. So um, I won't dwell too much, but basically you can see it copies memory and it, and it uh, uses uh, the idea of context numbers. It does, as I say, it runs in the SDK. That's what one of the other labs is about, the other piece of paper I mean is about. Um, and you can feel free in your own time when you've got your own SDK to go and, and play with that. Um, and with that, I'll be handing over to Chris to lead you through the CLI version. We're good. Okay. We'll get started then. So uh, for those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Chris Telfer. I work at Netronome, but for the purposes of this talk, you may call me the uh, Gavin Imposter. If you have multiple windows open, just right-click on the toolbar, open up PuTTY. You, this will come up, and you want to enter my server, my server into the address field to log in. So this is how you've been generating packets all, all day. So same, same as before. And uh, login is root, and password netronome as before as well. And again, for this demo, we will only need uh, one window, so I'm just going to blow it up and make it as big as possible. So for the first thing, the, if you are following the directions, uh, the first step is already a lie. Uh, it tells you to clone a repository. We've actually already done that for you. Uh, so if you do an ls-alf, you will see that there is an open nfp.git in your, in your repository, and that's where you need to go first. So you can cd into openNFP.git, tab completion works, and let's take a look inside. And this is going to contain um, both our lab 4 and our lab 5 code. So this will be uh, the place we will go to look at code for the lab 5 in the next tutorial as well. Okay. Okay. And while that's happening, actually I'll just talk a little bit about where we're actually going to be spending most of our time in the app subdirectory of this repository. Now we have uh, micro C and we have scripts and these are these directories contain lots of interesting code which is uh, infrastructure code for performing the op for, for uh, performing the exercises that we're going to be doing in this. Um, you I guess will be able to since all of this or a chunk of this is going to be put up on uh, OpenNFP.org, yes, um, in the near future. Um, we will, you'll be able to browse this at your leisure. What is it, son? Can you increase the font size? Can I increase <laughs> the font size? Yes, I suppose I can increase the, yes, yes, of course, I think. Should we bump it up some more? No? Good? We're good? All right. Okay. All right, so in this, so, uh, let's let's go into this apps directory that I've already mentioned, and in this apps directory, uh, you will see a a whole bunch of uh, directories. The one that we're going to be uh, the one that we're going to be playing with in this lab is uh, is well, we'll see. There is this lab for CLI uh, that has instructions that one can use that actually are exactly the instructions that you have on paper. So just to show you. You can cd to lab for CLI, and you'll see a readme file. And I happen to be a VI person, but you can open the editor of your choice and not throw Rotten Tomatoes if you're an Emacs user, whatever you feel. Uh, but uh, anyways, open up that readme file, and you will see exactly in Markdown the lab that we are going through here. So if you want another copy besides the web, and besides the, uh, and, and besides the paper copy, You'll, you'll see this is, this is uh, where you find it. Okay. So I'm going to back out of there. And now we will actually get to a few more steps in this. 
So the first step that we're going to do is we're going to take a, we're going to, we're going to copy a template of, which is mainly used in this exercise because Gavin showed you pretty much the entirety of the code. The template is mainly used for, for build infrastructure. It's to the, the make files and the, uh, the, the make file code needed to actually generate, uh, to compile the code into the NFP's firmware and, and uh, actually including uh, loading it onto the machine itself. So uh, to do that, we are going to copy dash R lab template to lab hello, oh, not in that directory, to lab hello world. Okay. And now we will go into this lab hello world. And in there, we will see a make file and a readme. And the, the readme gives you some, some information on how to build projects in, in the general sense. And the make file is very much incomplete right now, and we're going to be filling it in as part of this exercise. Okay. Uh, now, step six says to enter uh, a, a nice chunk of code. Now, I'm going to cheat. Um, the name of the file that we're going to use is we're going to do is create hello world.c. So I'm VIing hello world.c. And since I'm presuming this is Vim, it is good. I'm going to open up that readme that I mentioned before. And I'm going to cut and paste the code, which happens to be in that readme, right over to the other window. And then change the indenting. And that is what we have for our program. Uh, Gavin, offhand, do you know of an easier, quicker way to do a cut and paste for them? Except, well, you could go to the web page. You could go to the web page and you could copy and paste that way as well. Yep. Okay. So. Okay, so let's just walk through this code a little bit and see what, what's happening in here, okay? We're, while, while people are still inputting the code, um, we start out by declaring one variable, uh, which is an array of integers called old. This is the, the array we're going to read out of, and it contains the incredibly uh, complicated pattern, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes? Yes, I can. Yes, I was g very good question. Right. So the question is, what does this decal spec CTM mean? Uh, as Gavin has been telling you, the NFP chip has a lot of memories. In fact, it even has access to external memories that are on the same board. Uh, this decal spec CTM tells the compiler that I, it wants to locate this old variable in the cluster target memory CTM. Uh, of the ME that this software is loaded on. Okay. Uh, what that means is, as Gavin described, we have the whole chip laid out in islands. And each island, uh, well, most of the islands have micro engines on them, have flow processing cores or micro engines on them. Uh, some of them have 12 micro engines, some of them have four. But each micro engine lives in an island that also has a 256 kilobyte cluster target memory. Okay, and so by declaring this as decal spec CTM, we are telling the compiler, okay, when you, you're going to go load this code onto this micro engine, and by the way, you must allocate a region of cluster target memory in that micro engine's island to hold this array. Okay, and uh, similarly, we have a a new array, which is going to be sized exactly to the same number of elements as the old array. This one we are not initializing, so it will be zeroed out on, on program load. Right? 
Sorry, there's a question? No? Oh, I'm sorry. thought I heard a question. All right, so... Yes. That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, a fact we rely on extensively. Uh, so, and, and which our loader developers uh, rue us for. Um, anyways, okay, moving on. Uh, so we have our main function. Now, as Gavin indicated earlier, this main function is, uh, when usually when you write a C program, you think of the program executing in one thread, and if you say are a user of p-threads or fill-in-the-blank operating system, green threads, uh, whichever operating system you prefer, if you want additional threads, you usually have to spawn them, right? But the microengine programming environment is a little bit different. Instead, by default, all eight hardware threads in the microengine uh, will start within this main function and start executing. Uh, these Microengines uh, are not preempted by each other. They actually have to yield from one to the other. Uh, so first, one, one thread will start, and then when it yields, the next thread will be scheduled, and so forth and so on. But all of them will be ready to run when you load your, when you load your program. So the next line of this code says, okay, it, it basically com does a comparison on what is my thread number. And in this case, it's underscore, underscore, context. Sometimes we call these threads contexts, hardware contexts, but they're just hardware. They're, they, are, they are hardware threads, hardware managed threads in the core. So if I happen to be context number zero, then I get to do stuff. Otherwise, I just skip to the end of the program and I exit. So as Gavin said, each micro engine, even though it has eight threads running, only one of them is actually going to be doing real work. But all eight will run. Yes? Yes. Yes. That's correct. So is there some implicit assumption that thread zero is the one that started that starts up first and that the others are all suspended or what? That is usually how it works. We learn not to rely on it in case uh, sometimes people will stop threads and then restart them. And then you don't necessarily uh, you don't necessarily get that, but in general, yes, that's how it so, works. So the obvious question is: Suppose thread three starts up. Yes. Um, will there be a switch to thread four, or whatever, when he exits? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. So basically, you can start any thread, and eventually, will round robin schedule and get back to zero. Correct. A round rod, round robin among the available uh, the available schedule the available threads. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. Yes, question. Ah, excellent question. We will get to that shortly. Yes. Um, and the short answer is no, we're going to tell it which ones to run. Okay. So uh, what is this thread going to do that uh, when it's running? It's going to... You really like nested declarations. Oh, that's right. This is, this is an older example from the IXP days that we've poured into this, for those familiar. Okay. Uh, so it's going to declare two variables, an I and a size. The size is just going to be set to the length of the array, right? The size and the number of bytes of the array divided by the size of the element gives you the number of elements in the array. And then it's going to iterate over each element of both arrays, and it's going to set the value, uh, it's going to set uh, position i to the array to its correspondingly reversed fish position in the old array. Okay? So 0 is going to get position 9, 1 is going to get position 8, 7 is going to get position 6, and so forth and so on. So the new array will have the reversed old array. And, sorry? It's a point that I actually brought up to Gavin just before we, we went through this exercise. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, does everybody now have, uh, by this point, a program in their terminal saved in hello world.c? Are we good? Can we move on? Excellent. Excellent. All right. So we save our program. And now we are going to edit the make file. And 
This make file is nicely commented. It has this section called application definition starts here. Okay? And you can barely see it because it's in dark blue. But hopefully you'll be able to see it in your terminal. Uh, it's a little hard to see on the screen here. Okay, so we're going to now be putting in the lines that define how the compilation process will take this code and build firmware out of it, okay? Uh, so the first thing that we do is we have to tell the compiler, I want you to compile that C file of mine into an object file, which I will later assign to microengines. Um, and uh, as is pointed out in the guide, we have to be very careful about spaces because make files are very sensitive to the placement of spaces. So this, this really must be pretty much verbatim. So we start with a, a dollar sign left parens and an eval call. And we're calling into a, a macro that is all hidden in the infrastructure scripts that I mentioned before. And it's micro underscore c dot compile with RTL, comma, no spaces, hello world underscore object, OBJ, comma, hello world dot C, end parentheses, end parentheses. Okay. So this is basically telling it, okay, I want you to generate an object file named hello world obj out of hello world dot C. Okay. Okay, so as I said, and in answer to your question, which microengines are going to be running this code, uh, the next line in the makefile that we're going to add is going to assign that object file to run on specific microengines. So, following along from our handy dandy uh, readme, we have eval call fw.addobj. So calling the firmware add object macro, then hello world, comma, no spaces, hello world object, obj, sorry, comma, i32.me0 space, i32.me1, okay? So, this is saying, I want to take that object file, I'm going to associate it with the program, hello world, and I want it to run on two microengines, island32 microengine 0 and island32 microengine 1. So those two microengines specifically will be loaded with this code. Now, as Johan mentioned earlier, so this is, this is very explicit. This is absolute control over the placement of the code. This is in contrast to the IDE and P4 environment where we automatically have the tool chain try to optimally assign our software to the microengines to run. Okay. So here we have control and it's that old adage, with great power comes great responsibility. We're going to see that quite a lot. All right, so the last thing we do, so now we've defined one particular object assignment. That's all we're going to do for this particular exercise, so the next step is to just perform the linking step that takes all the object files and bundles it into a firmware. So the last line we add to this make file go, starts eval space dollar left paren call space firmware fw dot link with rt sims comma with no spaces hello world hello underscore world. So this is saying, I want you to, this is saying, please link hello world using the macro link with RT Sims. Okay? And that, that is the, what we have to, that is, that completes our make file for this exercise. So we can save it and we can run it by typing, we can execute it by typing make. Yes, and cross fingers. Hey, it worked. Yes. Successful compilation, no errors, okay? So at this point, uh, we now have in this directory uh, some object files, uh, a firmware, hello world, dot, hello underscore world dot firmware that'll be loaded on our, on our uh, chip. And we also have this handy dandy 
dot map file. Uh, the map file is interesting, so it's good. It's a good exercise to let's cat this hello world dot map file. And what this map file does is it actually describes the layout of the data structures as they were actually placed by the linker in the firmware. Okay, so in this case, we end up with uh, we end up with two data structures in here. Uh, and you can see that they are 704 bytes each. So what are those two data structures? Well, uh, the first of those is going to be our out array, and the second is going to be our in array. But you may recall that that out array and that in array, they were, they were 10 ints. And surely our integers aren't 70 bytes each, right? They're not. That, uh, and there's, there's actually not padding here. What's going on here is that by default, each thread gets its own private copy of that data structure, that out array. Okay? Even though we're only going to be running one thread per micro engine, all eight threads are each getting a copy of that out array, I'm sorry, that old array, I said out, that old array and the new array. So, that is why you see a, a nice largish data structure there. Okay. And you can see that there is a, a copy for each of the micro engines. Uh, one for ME0 and one for ME1 because each one gets their own copy. And uh, so that, that array, I'm sorry, that block is going to contain both the old and the new array. I misspoke. I think earlier I said that they were that they were, that one was the old and one was the new, but that's not true. I'm sorry, I have to take that back. The 704 bytes is the old and the new per thread. The first one is for the first microengine's private copies. The second one is for the second microengine's private copies. Okay. So, is everybody able to do this so far? Yes, good. Move on. Okay. So, now, we can actually run the program. <coughs> to do this, we can say make load underscore hello underscore world. And that will load and run the firmware. And now we have to, we, we don't actually know when the threads stop, yo. Uh, no start. Loaded the firmware, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, so the, the point being that the firmware is not actually running yet. Yes, okay. Okay, uh, with the firmware loaded, the memory will be initialized, so we can actually take a look at that memory. And we have a suite of tools on the command line that actually let you probe all of the memories in the system. We're gonna use one of them now. It's called NFP-MEM. So, I'm sorry, NFP-RT-SIM. Well, NFP-MEM, actually lets you probe any piece of memory in the system. NFP RT SIM lets you probe the memory by name. Instead of giving it an address, you can say, oh, I named the variable this, or the symbol was named this, so I will, I will um, fetch it by name instead of by absolute address. So I jumped ahead of myself again. My apologies. Uh, so we will do uh, NFP dash RT SIM dash dash len 176, we'll just look at the first 176 bytes of i32 dot me0 dot ctm underscore 40, and I'm, I'm getting that name from here, right here, okay? That's the, that's the symbol that we are asking it to, uh, to dump, and you'll see that there's that dollar TLS, but remember dollar has special meaning to the shell, so we have to escape it with a slash, slash dollar, TLS colon zero. The colon zero at the end means start at address zero within that symbol. So we're just dumping 176 bytes from the start of that symbol. And no runtime symbol, and I have a typo. Ah, I forgot the T. There we go. Who spotted that before I hit return? Ah, two, damn. And you didn't tell me. Fiend. <laughs> I'm no, I'm, I'm an imposter. <laughs> so 
as I said. All right, so here we have our um, here we have a dump of of an of uh, our old array, and as you can see, it's you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a, ten, right, and then zeros, a whole bunch of zeros. That's where the new array is going to pick up, and then there's another. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, following later on. So again, each one of those 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, tens is going to be one of the old arrays that is assigned per thread. In fact, we, could, we can omit the length and dump the entire thing, uh, I think. Oh, no. All right. Huh? It doesn't let you dump it if you thread local storage? Oh, OK. I can do it that way. So there. I did it with a argument of dash length 704 because I knew the length of the array from our handy dandy map symbols. And you can see that there are a whole series of old arrays interspersed with blocks of zeros. And you can see that there are blocks of zeros because like any good Unix hex dump utility, there's this star, which means repeat the last line for the next address and the next and next and the next address until you get to a line that has an address. Okay. So we have, our, we have our memory initialized. We have our firmware loaded. It is chomping at the bit. It's ready to run. So how do we run it? We execute the command. Make fw underscore start. And you should see it executing the command nfp nffw start. And that will run our code. And now we have to wait while the pitifully slow microengines grind through one at a time and copy one number to, oh, done already, sorry. Yes, so by now it's already finished copying the arrays, right? It's run all of the, all of the, the two microengines and all of the threads have run and completed long since. There are no breakpoints here. We just let it run and it's gone, right? So now we can inspect the memory region again. I will not dump all 174. And I went up to the wrong one, of course. And so now we can see, again, here at the start of the memory, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then a little bit of padding, and then 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then the next start of the next old array, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So all of this, again, is in an, a memory that is external to the running to the threads that we ran on this, um, so these this this program has actually been posting transactions to that external memory to to reverse the the one array into the other. Okay, should we keep going? We have a stopping point. Or just, just the shared one. I'll do the export. Export sounds good. All right, so we're going to change this program just a little bit now. Okay. So now in Hello World, we're going to change the decal spec. We're going to change the assignment of this program, the memory that we're assigning this, these variables to. Instead of just putting them in CTM and letting and having one copy per thread per ME, we're actually going to uh, export. We're going to we're going to add the the uh, we're going to add the keyword export, and then scope parentheses island. And what this is saying, in essence, is I want to share this variable with all of the MEs that are in the island, and all the threads in all the MEs that are in the island. So instead of having lots of copies of this, I'm saying I want one copy. And we will do the same thing here. So now we have declared old and new uh, separately. It, it, we have declared them uh, both with the uh, scope of island and exported so they are shared. And we can do a make to rebuild. And yes, it compiles, no typos. And let's check our map again. And now we see it looks similar, but not exactly the same. Now we actually see, first of all, the name of the symbol is now I32 underscore old. You see, see, since we're now not having 
lots and lots of copies, it, it, the linker instead names the symbol with the variable name. And the underscore is, is just a convention to avoid conflict with assembler symbols. Okay? But notice um, it's only 40 bytes as well because now we have one copy. It's an array of 10 integers. For, uh, so array, array of 10 4-byte integers, so it's 40 bytes. And we see the same thing is true with new. Okay. All right, now um, I think that's where we will wrap up this. But before you do anything else, uh, before you do anything else and before we go on to the next lab, a very important step. We don't want to leave this firmware running. Okay, so do a make, should be firmware unload. Yes, make fw underscore unload. And that will, that will stop the running firmware so that when we start up, we'll be in a good state for lab five. Okay, so be sure to do that before we close out. Any questions on this lab? Less pointy clicky, so it's easier to follow along, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just a little bit of a recap. Um, we do have a number of different transactional memories spread throughout the device. So we've just been playing with the CTM. Uh, we were putting it in the CTM and making it visible depending on whether you want to make it visible to all the threads or, yeah, you know, and then the lab it goes into more detail about making it visible to just the microengine, shared amongst the threads within the microengine, or shared amongst the island, or shared amongst all of the islands. Um, and um, so we we're placing it in the CTM inside the island, the 256k bytes. We could place it in the IMEM. We could place it in the EMEM. It's just a matter of, um, the annotation here for C to place it is a decal spec to the appropriate place with the appropriate scoping. The, um, the compiler generates uh, appropriate symbol translations, and the linker is then responsible for making sure that things get linked in all the magical ways that it takes. So um, the toolchain has a bit of added complexity here to enable <coughs> the memories to be loaded. Why do we put things in various places? Well. Um, if you're just going to play with data within a microengine within an island, then you might want to hand place it within the CTM because it's closer. There is a latency to get to the memory because of our posted transaction bus. Uh, if you want to share it more globally, you can put it into an IMEM or an EMEM. The EMEM is the one that's backed up by DRAM. So a DRAM transaction can take up to 500 cycles. But if you're going to be um, accessing it in the cache, then it might well be only 150 cycles or so even if it's in the EMEM. If you want to act, you know, put it into the 24 gigabytes of memory, then it's in the EMEM. So you choose where to put it. You can put it in the cluster scratch, which is even closer. Um, or you can even choose to put it right in the local memory, which is within the microengine, in which case it can't be shared even within the island. So we've done a little bit of behind the curtain, placing hand placing code onto microengines, hand placing things into memories. Well, we're placing things onto the workers, picking one to work on, and we're placing it into the transactional memories. So sort of getting a bit behind the curtain.